I'm Bo Wilson, grandson of Illini legend Dyke Edelman. What a pleasure it is to help explain to Illini fans everywhere the origins and meaning of fighting Illini and the incomparable three-in-one tradition. To discover the origins and meaning of fighting Illini, it is necessary to turn to the university archives, which we will reference often here. The term fighting Illini was used beginning in 1921. The best evidence suggests that it was developed and then used extensively as part of the fundraising campaign preceding the construction of Memorial Stadium. From the Illinois Alumni News publication, dated April 1925, page 221, regarding the stadium, it reads in part, how the stadium idea when it started some years ago did possess the imagination of us all. It was a slow day indeed, whose setting sun did not mark another period of slogans. Everybody composed them, especially during the prize contest that was held. Out of this came the battle cry of the stadium campaign, build that stadium for fighting Illini. Since the stadium was built to honor alumni, staff, and students who died during World War I, the term fighting Illini was seemingly being linked to military service. The term Fighting Illini appears as the headline of an article in the July 15, 1921 edition of the Illinois Alumni Quarterly and Fortnightly News, publicizing the stadium drive. In the article, it described a new booklet called Story of the Stadium. Note the following excerpt. It will begin with the original Illiniwick Indians and end with the last details about the Mammoth Stadium. From the beginning of the stadium campaign, there was an effort to connect an image of the Native American Illini to the University of Illinois students, athletes, and alumni. We have a heritage from the Illini Indian, the great heart, the fighting spirit. From the booklet, Story of the Stadium, comes the clear desire to link the admirable qualities seen in the Native Illini to fighting Illini athletics. The Illini Indian, he was a hunter and a fighter. He was an individualist, brave, and self-denying. Never were better people made than the Illini. They are vivacious. We have a heritage from them. 
It is the great heart, the spirit of individualism, of teaching our children to be free but brave, and to have a God, for these are the laws of our tribe. See us today living vitally in our heritage. Watch us play football. See us on the cinder track, on the baseball diamond. We are different. Somehow, we of the Middle West, not particularly better, but different. We are uniquely ourselves. But how can we express this self of ours, this character, which we have inherited from the Illini Indian and from our pioneer forefathers? A stadium may tell the world that we of Illinois have fought and died for our country and fought and lived for our fellow men. There will be a court of honor for every hero who died in the war in a great recreation field to bring greater vigor and life to our young men and women. It is undeniable from the very origins of fighting Illini athletics, war veterans, and the native Illini tribe were proudly associated with Illinois athletic teams. To early Illinois tribes, the word Illiniwick meant we are men, or the complete man. Football coach Bob Zupke is believed to be the first person to use the expression Illiniwick in describing the strength and character of his teams. On the front piece of Clarence Welsh's 1921 brochure, University of Illinois Memorial Stadium, a Native American is shown looking off to a cloud. The cloud includes a column which was originally proposed to stand at the north end of the stadium. In this same publication, Welsh describes what the stadium stands for. Speaking of the stadium, commemorates the sons of Illinois who fought in the Great War and still live. Commemorates those sons who fought and died. The stadium will become the symbol of a new, united, fighting, aspiring tribe of Illini who know how to honor their living heroes and venerate their dead. Another Stadium Drive publication, the Illinois Stadium for Fighting Illini, shows a Native American chief presenting the stadium as a gift to the university, symbolized by the library Carillion Tower. The cover of the Stadium Souvenir Program Dedication, Homecoming 1924, contains two figures rising above the left corner of the stadium. The drawing seemed to subtly suggest a soldier doughboy uniform, behind which is a figure suggestive of a Native American, not dissimilar to Laredo Taft's statue of Blackhawk in Oregon, Illinois. The sense of pride felt during the stadium campaign era in associating war veterans and the Native Illini to fighting Illini athletics could not be more apparent. The names of the Fighting Illini servicemen in World Wars I and II are engraved on the pillars of Memorial Stadium. This is how we ensure their legacy and heroism will never be forgotten. But what of our native Illini tribe? Who were the Illini Indians, also known as Illini Wick? In the 1600s, when American Indians first came into contact with Europeans in the Great Lakes region, two Native American ethnic groups inhabited the land that would eventually become the state of Illinois. The Illinois Confederation in the Miami tribe, the first group known to French explorers and missionaries as the Illinois or Illiniwick Indians, was a confederation of 12 tribes that occupied a large section of the central Mississippi River Valley, including most of what is today Illinois. The second group, the Miami tribe, lived in villages located south and west of Lake Michigan. During the 1700s and early 1800s, the territory of Illinois Indians shrank and the Miami tribe moved eastward. Other tribes then moved into Illinois to take over land formerly occupied by the Illinois and Miami. Some of the newly arrived tribes included the Fox, Iowa, Kickapoo, Muscoutin, Piankasha, Potawatomi, Sauk, Shawnee, Wee, and Winnebago. The Illinois Confederacy of Algonquin Tribes, formerly occupying South Wisconsin, Northern Wisconsin, and sections of Iowa and Missouri, included the five most populous tribes, the Cahokia, Kaskaskia, Michigamia, Peoria, and Tamaroa. The basis for the Illini Confederation of Tribes appears to have been common historical roots clan and kinship ties, and cultural commonality, the sub-tribes maintained a strong identification as being Illini. Even after a split, 
there was a single chief of the Illinois, as well as numerous sub-chiefs among the sub-tribe. Joliet spoke of meeting an Illinois village chief and subsequently being conducted to Peoria to meet the Grand Chief of the Illinois a central unifying authority figure among the Illini. Another great chief that we know of is Maman Tuensa, who was chief of the Kaskaskia tribes and later rose to the position of Grand Chief of the Illinois Confederation in the late 17th or early 18th century. In 1725, Maman Tuensa journeyed to France. He was accompanied by Chicago, a Michigamia village chief, who later fought at the Battle of Accia. At the time of first European contact in the Illinois Valley around 1666, many of the Illini lived in eastern Iowa along the Mississippi River, with some villages concentrated along the Illinois River in central Illinois. Marquette estimated their population at eight to 9,000 souls. Such a large group required a rich area to support them, and the Illinois River country was just that place. This location put them in close proximity to the central Illinois plains, which nourished herds of bison upon which the Illini preyed. The Illinois enjoyed annual buffalo hunts, which were often expedited by firing the prairies. This had the additional benefit of keeping these prairies open and free of forests, which in turn made them suitable for bison, elk, and deer. This country of the Illinois was both beautiful and bountiful. The desirability of the Illinois country would in great measure prove to be the undoing of the Illinois. Its attractiveness was an irresistible magnet to the warlike tribes of Wisconsin and its richness in furs likewise attracted the unwanted attention of the Iroquois to the east. Indians hunted in Illinois as far back as 5000 BC and today you can still view the remains of their civilization at such places as Cahokia Mounds, North America's largest and most valuable prehistoric earthwork relic. The earliest inhabitants of Illinois were prehistoric mound builders. The Illini had a sharp division of labor. The main activities of the men were hunting and warfare, while women worked in the fields. In fact, women did much of the work around the camp and village. The Illini found it easy to grow their maize, pumpkins, and squash with which to vary their diet. They dried maize and stored it against the predictable shortages of winter. Fish were also plentiful in the Illinois River and its tributaries when necessity demanded their harvest. The Illini did not use the birch bark canoe according to some sources. Instead, they used pirogues, which were boats made by hollowing out logs with adzes and fire. The Illinois used them to cross the Mississippi River as well as to navigate the Illinois River, its tributaries, and the shoreline of Lake Michigan. The Illini men practiced the ritual of dream seeking at the age of 15 or so. The young men painted their faces and removed themselves to a secluded location to fast and pray. They hoped for a vision that would reveal a spirit guardian to them who would be their helper throughout life. The Illinois were almost constantly harassed by the Sioux, Foxes, Winnebago, and other northern tribes. About the same time, the Iroquois waged war against them, which lasted several years and greatly reduced their numbers, while liquor obtained from the French weakened them further. About the year 1750, they were still estimated at 1,500 to 2,000 souls. Then, the murder of the celebrated Chief Pontiac by a Kaskaskian Indian about 1760 provoked the vengeance of the lake tribes on the Illinois, and a war of extermination was begun which, in a few years, reduced them to a mere handful. Survivors took refuge with the French settlers at Kaskaskia, while the Sock Foxes, Kickapoo, and Potawatomi took possession of the country. In 1800, there were only about 150 Illinois left. In 1833, the survivors, represented by the Kaskaskia and Peoria, sold their lands in Illinois and moved west of the Mississippi. In 1854, the Kaskaskia and Peoria united into a single tribe with the Wee and Piankashaw, called the Peoria Tribe of Indians. Located in Miami, Oklahoma, the Peoria Tribe of Indians of Oklahoma is a federally recognized sovereign Indian tribe. The rich Native American history of Illinois is an important part of our state's heritage 
as well as the heritage and traditions of Fighting Illini athletics. The incomparable three-in-one is a tradition forged in the early years of the Marching Illini's history from three distinct pieces of the university's heritage. The Marching Illini formation was created by A.A. Harding and his assistants in the early 1920s, making it the oldest part of the three-in-one. The marching drill for this formation originally consisted of a march down the field in a block I formation. In a marching into the ILL INI formation, once the band had marched back down the field. The present day versions of the marching Illini is similar to the original, but is highlighted by an intricate counter march that allows the band to form the ILL INI letter by letter as it marches back down the field. Another important piece of the three in one, Chief Illiniwick was part of the tradition since 1926. The Chief first appeared at the home football game with Pennsylvania that year dancing to the newly written March of the Illini before going to midfield to meet a Pennsylvania band member dressed up as a Quaker and smoke a peace pipe. The musical portion of the three-in-one consists of three distinct Illinois pieces, Pride of the Illini, March of the Illini, and Hail to the Orange. Pride of the Illini, written by Carl King with words by Ray Dvorak, expressly for Illinois bands, was published in 1928 it begins with the lyrics, We are marching for dear old Illini, for the men who are fighting for you. The pride of the Illini pays tribute to the men who are fighting for you. The Fighting Illini nickname has historically been used interchangeably to describe the athletic teams and war veterans. However, when hearkening back to the stadium campaign publications, most all references to the Fighting Illini was associated with war veterans. The Pride of the Illini can therefore be seen as a tribute song to the war veterans for whom Memorial Stadium was named. Harry Alford's March of the Illini was also published in 1928, but was used during Chief Illiniwick's performance from the beginning in 1926. The March of the Illini was composed prior to the debut of Chief Illiniwick with a tom-tom drum beat to acknowledge the Indian heritage already on campus. The Indian heritage on campus at that time can be traced to the imagery of the native Illini tribe used extensively during the stadium campaign. The March of the Illini can therefore be seen as a tribute song to our native Illini tribe. The third piece of the three-in-one medley is Hail to the Orange. It was written by Harold Hill with words by Howard Green in 1910. Hail to the Orange is a tribute song to the alma mater, the University of Illinois. The three pieces were eventually combined into a medley and given the title Three in One. The three in one drill and music are an important part of the university's heritage. From careful examination of the university archives, it is apparent that during the stadium era campaign, the Fighting Illini name was an allusion to the university veterans who fought in the Great War. Although the native Illini tribe was not associated with the Fighting Illini name per se, it is clear that the students and alums of the stadium era campaign sought to associate with the Illini tribe and fighting Illini athletics more broadly. The best possible way to pay tribute to veterans and the Illini tribe is through Native American powwow culture. Powwows are an opportunity for non-native people to interact with native peoples to learn about and experience authentic Indian culture. Non-natives are even encouraged to participate in designated dances at powwows. Native culture is extremely deferential to military servicemen and women. Anyone who has served in our nation's military can be part of the military color guard at a powwow. Each powwow begins with a ceremony called the grand entry. Typically, the color guard leads the procession of dancers into the dance area. The unity celebration begins with a brief grand entry with the color guard leading the dancers and flag bearers to their individual positions to traditional singing and drumming. In Native American culture, the drum represents the heartbeat of Mother Earth. The songs are performed in a high-pitched singing style to include words, a chant, or a combination. Following the grand entry, the next part of the unity celebration is an intertribal dance. After this performance, we move right into the playing of the three-in-one. The first medley, the Pride of the Illini, is a tribute to the men who are fighting for you. 
specifically military veterans. The military color guard takes their place of honor on the court during its playing. The second medley is the March of the Illini, a tribute song to our native Illini tribe. The dancers take their position at center court. The female dancer performs a jingle dance, while the men perform a fast-paced fancy dance to an authentic custom drum beat in cadence with the band. Modern Native American music often combines contemporary styles and genres with the traditional. The March of the Illini was composed without lyrics prior to the debut of Chief Illiniwick. In the Unity Celebration, these words would be sung during the March of the Illini. This is your native land. We sing and march to honor you. We have a heritage from the Illini Indians, the great heart, the fighting spirit. In fancy dance, the dancers are required to strike an ending pose on the final drum beat. In this performance, the pose is of crossed wrists as a symbol of unity. The symbolism is taken from the Peoria tribe emblem with crossing arrows representing a banding together. Ironically, during football game performances, marching Illini drummers have a tradition of crossing their drumsticks at this exact juncture during the three and one. Next is the Flag of Nations presentation during the horn stanza, prior to the playing of Hail to the Orange. An ethnically diverse group of students carry the national flag of their various homelands onto the court as a tribute to the University of Illinois and its commitment to inclusion and diversity in the ultimate display of unity. Next, the playing of Hail to the Orange. The head male dancer extends his arms as the traditional show of respect for the alma mater. The performance concludes as always with the second playing of the March of the Illini. In all, a majestic sea of color and pageantry and a stirring tribute to our military veterans, our native Illini tribe, and the beloved alma mater. It is truly the defining three within the three in one. Once again, giving Fighting Illini Athletics the most exciting four minutes of college athletics. Native American powwow culture is the ultimate platform to promote inclusiveness and unity. The performance you're about to witness is called the Unity Celebration. It was filmed in Quapaw, Oklahoma, with eight of the participants having Peoria tribe ancestry. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the Unity Celebration culminating in the incomparable three in one.
You have just witnessed a glimpse of the future, the Unity Celebration. Transforming what had become in more recent years a source of controversy into the ultimate rallying stage for Unity. This kind of Native American cultural celebration has become very commonplace at sporting events, especially over the past decade. Sporting venues ranging from high school, National Collegiate Athletic Association, Major League Baseball, National Football League, National Basketball Association, and other leagues have paid tribute to our nation's Indian heritage via traditional dance presentations pre-game and at halftime. For the past several years, the University of Tennessee Native American Student Association has organized their local Cherokee tribes to perform at halftime alongside the pride of the Southland Band in honor of Native American Heritage Month. The Native American community has emphatically spoken. The way for sports teams to honor Native American heritage is through authentic cultural celebrations on their grandest stages of athletics. These halftime cultural tributes violate no current NCAA policy, and therefore, this could be the new halftime tradition at Illinois, even without tribal endorsement. Hopefully this video has been helpful in revealing the origins and meaning of Fighting Illini and the incomparable three-in-one tradition. Illinois is in a most exclusive club, being one of just eight NCAA teams to have tribal affiliation. That affiliation is something that the vast majority of Illini Nation takes enormous pride in. While most teams take on non-serious generic identities such as Bulldogs, Tigers, and the like, there's only one Fighting Illini. It is a unique and serious identity that demands a serious representation. Are there any more worthy representatives for Fighting Illini Athletics than military veterans and authentic Native American singers and dancers emblematic of our Native Illini tribe? Most everyone watching is likely to be pro-chief. We all miss the revered symbol of Fighting Illini Athletics for decades. However, in this moment, we have an opportunity to build a new, inspiring tradition. Not just for ourselves, but for future generations of Fighting Illini fans. Together, let's build the new tradition for Fighting Illini.